Hello everyone, thank you for joining our webinar today um, about everything you wanted to know about VEDS. So to give a brief uh, presentation of our experts and moderator today for this webinar, we have Professor Tristan. Um, he's a professor of vascular medicine from the APHP Hôpital European Georges Pompidou in France. We also have Dr. Anna Stenberg, who's a physician at the Uppsala University Hospital in Sweden. And we also have um, our EPAC co-chair for the medium-sized arteries working group and also the vice president of the Spanish National Patient Organization. You will all be seeing all of them later on in the presentation. For this webinar, we've gathered questions from, different, from patients across Europe, from Spain, from Italy, from France, and we would like to share these videos with you with all these very, very pressing questions, and our experts will be on hand afterwards to answer these questions. Thank you. Hoi, ik ben Iris en ik kom uit Nederland. Mijn vraag is, er zijn twee vormen van collagen 3 a mutaties een dominante negatieve mutatie en een haploinsufficiënte mutatie. Wat betekent dat voor de prognose, de behandeling, leefregels en preventief onderzoek? Dankjewel. Il mio nome è Monica, ho 48 anni e la mia domanda è: si sta facendo ricerca sulla terapia genica per la sindrome di Ehlers-Danlos vascolare? Grazie. Bonjour, Tristan Duperon, France. Ma question serait de savoir quelle est la prise en charge, le traitement, la surveillance spécifique qu'il faut avoir pour un adolescent de 13-14 ans étant très sportif et atteint du sed vasculaire. Merci. Bonjour, je m'appelle Claire, je suis française. La question est, quelle est l'espérance de vie Merci. Hola, me llamo Jessica, soy de Málaga, en España. Tengo 35 años y mi pregunta es la siguiente. Yo actualmente tomo los Sartal y Celiprolol. ¿Existe algún otro medicamento para nuestra patología de cara a un refuerzo de, de las arterias? Muchas gracias. Hola, mi nombre es Victoria. Eh, soy una persona afectada por el herdalos vascular y me gustaría saber, eh, en una persona que ha tenido bastantes roturas arteriales, ¿el embarazo está totalmente contraindicado? Muchas gracias. Hola, soy Iris y vengo de Nederland. Mi pregunta es... Als een patiënt met VEDS een tandheelkundige ingreep nodig heeft, zoals het trekken van een kies, moet dit dan door een kaakchirurg gedaan worden? Bedankt. Ciao a tutti, mi chiamo Laura, ho 29 anni, ho la sindrome di Ehlers-Danlos vascolare, mi chiedevo sempre se ci fossero dei farmaci per pazienti VEDS per trattare il dolore. Per mia esperienza no. E comunque ringrazio per dar voce anche ai vascolari. So now we would be moving forward and answering our moderator Eva will be available now. We'll be coming on now to look at all to ask all these questions that we have to our experts. I think you're muted, Eva. Thank you. Thank you, Treasure. So actually, we have gathered the questions we have received from um, patient community across Europe, and uh, we have um, gathered them in categories. So we encourage you to write down your questions in the Q&A uh, panel so that uh, we will be replying them um, along the way or at the end of the webinar in the Q&A section. So let's start with the genetic section. And the first question is, uh, what would be the monitoring and prevention protocol in patients with col 3 a one variant of uncertain significance? Or for those who are not symptomatic, is there a risk of aneurysm or spontaneous rupture in these cases as well? Please, Tristan. Hola, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Eva, for this question from patients. And thanks a lot for all the testimonies coming from patients all over Europe. Uh, this is the first time that we share uh, 
testimonies like this from patients and I hope it is very important uh, for you, but also it is for us uh, to have the opportunity to answer writing questions like this. Uh, my answer would be that the presence of a CORT 3 a one variants of a known significance, which is also uh, classified as class number three in the ACMJ um, classification, which has five uh, grades of variants. Uh, it must not be taken as a pathogenic variant of CORS 3A1 that defines a VEDS. Therefore, one should not stop exploration after finding a variant of unknown significance. Depending on the type of the VUS, VUS, either you will have an mRNA, like the vaccine for COVID-19, mRNA, the transcript analysis based on fibroblast culture after a skin biopsy, or you can also have a family segregation analysis. It is the fact that you will see if uh, members of the same family share symptoms of the uh, vascular SDL syndrome and share the same VUS. Um, this, the culture to get the transcript or the segregation analysis may help at reclassifying the views to a probably non-pathogenic class 2 or to a probably pathogenic class 4 variant in the classification. So when you have a VUS, VUS variant of a known significance, you cannot um, ascertain the diagnosis of vascular resident syndrome. You have to go further with more explorations, either to get a baning variant or to get a pathogenic variant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan. Uh, so the next question is, um, there are two forms of cov 3 a one mutations, a dominant negative mutation and a hyperinsufficient mutation. What does this mean for the prognosis, uh, treatment guidelines and preventive testing? Thank you again. Um, so as mentioned, the rarer form of VDS, I think it was a question from the the patient from Netherlands. The rarer form of VDS is a variant leading to haploinsufficiency. It means that half proportion of the collagen type 3 is produced, but this amount is approximative. What is certain is that only normal collagen type 3 is produced. Patients develop symptoms of the disease at older age, and the tissue fragility seems less important than the majority of the variants in VITS uh, affecting the glycine amino acid, called dominant negative. Therefore, the prognosis is better in case of MPLO insufficiency than dominant negative variants. However, preventing measures, medical therapies should be the same. There is maybe one difference um, for haploinsufficiency that the vaginal delivery in case of childbearing might be considered in case of haploinsufficiency, whereas cesarean section or C-section is recommended in dominant negative variants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan. And we have a third question regarding genetics. Um, is there any research on genetic therapy for vascular EDS ongoing? Well, oh. I will. Yeah, thank you. I will go quicker on this answer because unfortunately there is no uh, genetic therapy available right now for VDS. The only genetic therapy available for patients are therapies using denatured viral vector that allows the cells to produce a missing protein. And in the case of VDS, actually, it is more complicated and there is no genetic therapy in a close future, unfortunately. Complicated because first, the protein is misfolding and not missing. And second, because the protein is extracellular, meaning that it is synthesized into the cells, but it needs to go outside the cells. So in VDS, it means that we should be able to replace the misfolded protein within the extracellular matrix by new and then generate a new protein that will go outside the cell. So 
unfortunately, uh, genetic therapy is not for a close future in uh, VEDS, but uh, teams are working on that, of course. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, if, if uh, someone has a question regarding genetics, we can take it now. Um, actually, um, we have one question, um, which uh, has to do with the uh, phenotype. So maybe we can take it in this section. Um, how much the minor characteristics, typical face, acrogeria, alopecia, influence the severity of arterial rupture in terms of longevity? Okay, I can answer or try to give an answer. Um, there is no real correlation. So uh, if I understand well the question, it, the, the minor characteristic that this is uh, what we can see on the hands or on the face, if it is associated with a more severe um, phenotype on the arterial events, rupture, dissection, aneurysm. But we, it has never been uh, correlated really. And so uh, I would not um, give any uh, uh, weight uh, to uh, have a prognosis on future arterial event based on acrogeria, for example, or the face of one patient. Thank you very much. So I think we can move um, on to the next um, category, which is um, dealing with vascular EDS. So um, first question. Um, as the years go by, our body stops producing collagen. How does that affect our disease? Um, our arteries become even weaker. What effect does it have? So, so yeah, I will answer that. Then Anna is going to answer for the other questions. No worries. Um, it's quite true. Actually, collagen production is not altered with age, and it would rather expect a trend in reduction. Actually, it increased with age. The, the the stiffening of the artery. So um, with age, we expect a reduction of the arterial events because the stiffness of the arterial wall is increasing with age. It is physiological. I mean, it, it's not specific to VDS. And for the, uh, for example, for the arterial events, it can appear later than for smaller arteries uh, because the, the wall of the artery is, uh, is uh, thicker than uh, muscular small arteries. Perfect. Thank you, Tristan. Um, another question. Can a dissection recover on its own? Yes. Um, now, um, thank you for this opportunity to be in this webinar. And um, this is a positive answer that, in fact, we quite often see that uh, arterial dissections do uh, heal spontaneously without any surgical intervention. Um, or only blood pressure control will, will be important. Uh, then on the other hand, uh, it can take a long time for it to heal or it can remain uh, this dissection and uh, become chronic. And then we would want to keep it under surveillance, surveillance with uh, X-ray or ultrasound examinations. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. Um, so uh, we have again a question regarding dissections. Uh, dissections can recover spontaneously within a few weeks, especially with smaller vessels and further blood pressure reduction. Any other useful advice to speed up that healing process? Would you like to comment further on this? Uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have we don't have any other specific um, strategies to help uh, dissections to heal. But um, quite often they really do heal, so. Thank you. And um, another question, what is the management um, regarding monitoring medication and so on for a 14 year old sporty vascular EDS teenager? Yes, 
um, um, this is coming from a, a French patient, if I remember well, uh, and his first name is Tristan, so I'm <laughs> I share this. And in symptomatic patients, we can start beta blockers actually, and sediprolol uh, specifically as soon as the first event. So if it's at the age of four, uh, we will uh, start the, the the beta blocker with approved molecule in children. In asymptomatic patients, it is another um, question because um, we usually we usually start the beta blockers. Uh, first after confirmed diagnosis of EDS and not suspected ones. And then at the age where the, the, the asymptomatic patient can understand all the impact of the genetic test and all the impact of the treatment. So approximately uh, after teenage, uh, on teenagers, uh, so 14 to 50 years old. Regarding the physical activity, lifestyle should be modified and um, to fit uh, to uh, sports that can be continued via VDS. And uh, I think we have more specific questions later in the webinar on this topic. Thank you, Tristan. Um, we have a last question for this category. Um, how should life expectancy be interpreted? Well, the preventive measures and CD4 as a way to reduce uh, adverse events. Um, and um, life expectancy increased with the increased knowledge uh, among the medical community and rare disease organization and networking. Published data are also to be taken with caution because we see the worst cases were diagnosed. We diagnose relatives of older age in systematic family screening, which emphasize that there is a viability, a large viability in symptoms and critical events. So um, the published um, data on survival should be uh, taken with caution. And uh, now there is a, a patient of uh, more than 70 years old. I, I guess there is in some families maybe of the participants. And so based on the treatment, based on the screening and based on the preventive therapies, the age is increasing in the uh, population of VDS patients. Thank you, Tristan. So actually we can move to the next question. There are several questions already in the chat, but uh, we can um, answer them um, in the future categories. So actually we can move to the next one, which is medication. And um, the first question is, what is the best medication to strengthen the arteries? Um, it has been mentioned Celiprolol and Losartan. So what's your, what's your um, answer to that? What's your opinion to that, Anna and Tristan? Sorry, there were three questions actually quite around the same topic. Do you prefer to to read them and then we can go uh, on the, the treatment strategy? Yes, um, fantastic. Um, so there's another question. Uh, there are conflicting research results, uh, survival rate with celebral treatment, and this seems to be partially partially dose dependent. What is the state of affairs? What is the advice on this when treating vascular EDS? Are there better alternatives, for instance, Losartan? Um, we have another question about Celebrol. At what, at what age should Celebrol be taken? And then we have another one, um, yes, regarding medication as well. Uh, certain blood pressure lowering drugs have a beneficial effect on the quality of the aortic wall, such as beta blockers, for instance, propanolol. Uh, and sartans, angiopepsin receptor blockers, for instance, low sartan. Um, they delay growth of aneurysms, but not yet known if it also works in vascular EDS. Um, is it more known, known about this now? So, <clears throat> I will answer to these all questions about sediprolol, about other beta blockers, and another class of treatment, which is uh, on Jotansin 2, 
receptor blocker, uh, like losartan, for example. So regarding the steady prolol, actually the reduction of the RTL events was obtained with the full dose of the treatment, which is 200 milligrams B in DA, so it's 400 milligram a day, in, uh, 200 at morning and 200 at night. And the adverse effect, the adverse effects, sorry, of uh, this dose can be fatigue or loss of energy. So that sometimes uh, the physician um, can reduce the dosage of the uh, uh, celiprolol to the well tolerated, the previous well tolerated prescription. Regarding other beta blockers, they have not been tested actually in VDS either in, um, on patients, and so we can use them sometime because uh, celiprolol is not available in all European countries. So in some countries, patients cannot have access to celiprolol. So physicians prescribe another beta blocker or Sometimes also because celiprolol cannot be tolerated by the patient. Even if you taper the dose, even with 100 milligram per day, which is a, the smallest dosage, there is too much side effect, so you have to replace to another beta blocker. Now regarding the angiotensin 2 receptor blocker, uh, like losartan, there is a study in France that compared another uh, sartan, which is irbe sartan, to placebo. And the follow-up of the studies is closed now, and we wait for the results that should be delivered soon. And it was on top. It means uh, patients re already received celiprolol, and we are adding irbesartan to the beta blocker treatment. There is also a results in mice. Um, actually, in mice, uh, it is true that uh, with losartan. Uh, there were a reduction of the uh, arterial event, arterial dissection, but this was in mice. And sometimes we know that translation from mice to human cannot be applied. Um, now for the, the beta blockers, uh, I think it's uh, the same answer for Jung. Um, at what age should celiprol be taken? As already answered, in symptomatic patients, it can be started uh, as soon as the age of four years old. But in asymptomatic patients, we usually uh, wait to uh, the teen age. So it is uh, starting at 14 or 15 years old. Amazing. Thank you, Tristan. Would you like to, to comment, Anna? Uh, Yes, please. Uh, I was just wanting to comment on other um, beta blockers that there was this uh, British study from the Sheffield where they uh, they showed how they were treated their patient with bisoprolol and losartan. It was not a randomized study, but still so there is there are some data on, on bisoprolol, uh, even if it's not a randomized study. So that was just my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. So um, we can then move on to, to the next uh, category, which is pregnancy. And uh, we have already seen one question uh, in the video. Um, and it's a patient that is asking, in my case that I have had quite a few episodes of arterial ruptures, is pregnancy totally contraindicated? Uh, well, um, yeah. what I would like to say is um, for us as physicians, we unfortunately will have to, to recommend against it um, because there is a very high risk of serious vascular complications. Um, but still, uh, having said that, um, uh, you should still uh, always be recommended uh, for you and for your partner and that you should request a multidisciplinary meeting, a meeting with these uh, physician experts, obstetrician and the VEDS, VEDS doctor, so that you can get all the information concerning pregnancy in VDS and you can get the full picture and that uh, makes you confident so you can make your decision. And uh, so it's it's really complicated. 
uh, but you you deserve to have the full picture uh, um, and make your decision. Perfect. Thank you very much, Anna. We have another question regarding pregnancy. Would breastfeeding be harmful in women with vascular IBS if everything went well during pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum? Uh, yes, I will try to answer this question. So, um, for breastfeeding, actually, the fact that the mother takes sediprolol or another beta blocker, um, the drug passes into the milk. So. Uh, therefore, breastfeeding shall not be done while taking beta blockers. Otherwise, it will uh, slower the uh, rate, the cardiac uh, rate of the fetus too low, of the baby, sorry, too low. And so um, it is. Uh, that's why it is not recommended breastfeeding uh, uh, after delivery, just because the mother is taking a, a beta blocker. Anna, would you like to to comment on the answer? Um, or and, oh, um, I definitely agree. Uh, it's our experience as well that uh, we unfortunately need to recommend against breastfeeding. Thank you. So let's move to the next category, which is lifestyle. And um, actually, we, we have one question regarding exercise, and I see we already have a question in the chat about it. So um, actually, it's uh, pretty much the same. This is a very popular question uh, amongst the patient community. What kind of exercise can we do that has no impact and that uh, requires mild effort while strengthening our muscles? And uh, we have also the question in the chat asking what exercise is safe? Is it keeping pulse and blood pressure to certain limits? Can some weights be included? Uh, yes, I, I would like to, to answer this question. And um, exercise is definitely important if you have uh, VEDs. It's important to have strong musculature around your joints uh, to prevent complications. Um, but um, there are three things that you should consider. So number one, you need to avoid uh, activities with a high risk of trauma, like for example, boxing would not be a good idea. And then the second thing is you need to avoid static exercises. Uh, and that is when you make the muscles tense, but without movement over the joints. And perhaps the best example is this so-called plank. Uh, which is a very common exercise and you should avoid. And it's a type of calisthenics, which was um, also asked for. Uh, so what we instead do recommend is dynamic exercise, and that's the opposite of static exercise. Um, then you uh, have movement uh, across the joints and uh, examples of that kind of exercise is when you're lifting something or when you're walking. So you can also maybe these static exercises, these um, terms are a bit, we don't talk about them in normal life, but that that is what is recommended when you have VEDs. And also number three, you need to really limit the intensity of your exercise. So for weightlifting, you should avoid very heavy weights. And the test to know how if something is too heavy is if you need to hold your breath to lift something, then it's too heavy. But if you can breathe through the whole um, uh, exercise, then then it's the the, um, the recommended um, uh, intensity. And for uh, endurance training like cycling or running or that kind of thing, then the test to know if it's the right intensity is if you can uh, continue your conversation, if you can talk during what you're doing, then that uh, then it's not too intense. You should also not uh, uh, train until you're exhausted and not test your limits and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, that we would recommend these limitations. 
but most of all not be completely passive or just you need to move that it's important for the blood vessels really and your, how your life quality also thank you very much anna so uh, the next question uh, and again we have received uh, this question from the patient community and we see it again uh, in the chat so again it's a, a quite popular one um, what type of diet and nutrition is the best for us? Vitamins, minerals, supplements, foods to avoid, uh, etc. And then in the chat, they are asking about uh, vitamin C. Can vitamin C help arterial strength? Uh, yes. Um, the, regarding this uh, subject, it, it, we don't have this uh, perfect scientific data, um, but only the advice that we uh, we feel confident to give and um, regarding food uh, you can really follow normal advice for healthy food and as you I'm sure you know to reduce sugar and refined carbohydrates and re reduce the heavily processed food instead to uh, try to increase whole grain vegetables fruit and this uh, kind of food and um, one good example of a good diet is the so-called Mediterranean diet uh, which has been shown to reduce cardiovascular disease and we have um, many reasons to believe this is also valuable if you have VEDS which uh, is a special kind of cardiovascular disease and uh, for the vitamins uh, we tend to recommend vitamin C for patients who have problems with bruises and uh, so that is something We'd recommend even if we don't have some very hard scientific evidence and um, when you talk uh, thinking about supplements uh, you don't really need uh, if you have a, a really healthy food then you don't need to take any supplements at all um, but if you were to think of some mineral supplement for example uh, i would suggest uh, considering magnesium supplements. Um, it's available prescription free and um, in several studies in other vascular diseases, there is indication it uh, could be beneficial for the endothelial cells in the blood vessels. And uh, one thing that's a very useful effect, it's a, it has been used to prevent constipation. It's been used for that for hundreds of years and there's a lot of um, we have a lot of uh, uh, habits to, to use this um, uh, magnesium supplementation. And uh, if you think about safety and taking this supplement, it's, it's very safe really because it's not so much absorbed from the, from the bowels. And uh, we tend to excrete uh, if we take in too much magnesium. So it's, it's very safe unless you have some severe uh, uh, kidney disease. Uh, the only thing if you uh, were to try it, uh, it's that uh, it could inhibit uptake of some other some other medications. So you might need to take it maybe two hours after uh, some medications. For example, some of the antibiotics will not work well with the magnesium supplements. And uh, one supplement that I would uh, caution against is omega-3 supplements, um, since uh, in some people it increases bleeding uh, risk. So that would be avoided. That's all. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Um, the next one, um, when traveling, how can we easily find where there is an expertise center or specialized hospital nearby at the time uh, we are on vacation? Actually, um, I, I could answer um, for that one because we are very used to use these tools. So we would recommend using the Vastern app where you can find um, the location of the, of the healthcare providers, those hospitals with experience on your disease around Europe. Um, you can also check, of course, Vastern uh, website. Uh, and there are some other patient organizations that also have information regarding this. You can approach them, um, such as um, Anavas Challenge in the UK, um, LSLO Society, which is um, which covers Europe and also globally. Uh, there is, of course, 
um, the European patient organizations like uh, ANSET or AFSET for France, ISET for Italy, VED for the Netherlands and so on. And finally, you find also information in the, um, the VITS movement, which is uh, more centered in the USA. And um, actually, also regarding about information, they were asking if there is an app for vascular EDS patients, not specific, specifically that we know of, but again, you can use the Vastern app and then uh, you can check um, through the app, you can check about the disease uh, in the Orphanet website and you can get some information there. So it's, um, it's a very good way to get uh, information about the disease uh, through your phone. And we have a last, a last question regarding lifestyle, which, um, uh, which is, uh, are the risks when uh, flying or traveling by airplane uh, more risks of unreasons, ruptures, EDC? And we would like to mention that this is a general question. So should you have any specific concern about your condition or your situation, please do con uh, consult your doctor. But I mean, again, as a general, um, as a general question, what would you say? Yeah, Aina, Anna, I guess. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, so, yes, uh, travel is, is a very normal thing to do, and you should not avoid it if you have beds. And we don't have any indications that it's harmful for a VEDS patient to travel by airplane. Perfect. And, I can, and Tristan, yes. Yeah, just I, re I answered the Q&A because there were, as you mentioned, Eva, specific questions in a patient with a aortic dissection. So it is not, I guess, the place to give any advice on medical advice that we don't uh, that we don't have. So for you uh, who has this uh, Stanford type B dissection, you should go and see your doctor, your physician, and ask precisely the question for flights. Perfect. Thank you very much. So we move to the next category, which is uh, risk and intervention. And um, first question, if a patient with vascular EDS needs dental surgery, like pulling a molar, should it be done by an oral surgeon? Well, um, actually, there is no um, contraindication for tooth extraction. The dentist or the oral surgeon must be aware of the potential increased bleeding time, uh, but there is no um, risk for arterial events because this is very a small, small, small artery, so there's no impact. But the bleeding time, which is the time to obtain coagulation, so the dentist uh, must wait longer than expected to obtain the coagulation. So uh, it's uh, only the, the thing that should be uh, done to your dentist or oral surgeon, and it will take appropriate preventive measures uh, to uh, reduce this bleeding. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is uh, regarding surgery. Uh, Vasculidia surgery is risky due to ruptures and it might threaten life. Are low risk invasive surgery procedures possible for vascular EDS patients? Um, how can a plan of action before surgery can be achieved to minimize the risk? Thanks, Evan. Thanks for the patient who asked this question, because um, in my point of view, it is one of the most important thing in VDS patient is concertation between the physicians taking care of the patient, because First, it's a very rare disease, so not all physicians know about this disease, so multidisciplinary team is very important. Second is because there is specific um, uh, preventive measures for anesthesia, for the surgeon, for the cardiologist. So if everyone is aware about the diagnosis and how to handle it, it will go to a better prognosis for the intervention. So consultation between the VDS specialist, the surgeon, the anesthetist is of, of most importance to balance the risk and the benefit 
of any intervention. So it should be, of course, in case of emergency, sometimes you don't have time, but most of the time, if it's a planned intervention, there must be this multidisciplinary talk team that will balance the benefit and the risk of any intervention and say go for it, or maybe we should see for another option. So all interventions are not contraindicated, but shall not be performed before any consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan. This is indeed very important. Um, I have a question. Um, and this patient asks, I would like to ask what preventive means can help to avoid having a recurrence of intestinal and gastric ruptures or perforations? Is there more evidence that after intestinal perforation, the intestines are affected again? Maybe I'll so start oh, yeah. with the answer and then Anna will complete. Uh, Perfect. My, my, my answer, I, I guess, is, is quick. So, so far we do not find any certain way to prevent the uh, colonic rupture. We recommend to pay attention for all the patients to any sign of constipation and treat with diet and laxatives if needed. But maybe Anna, you want to complete uh, my answer. Well, it's important to to consider that it's the colon. It's just this. It's more this one part of the of the bowels that are affected. So, some vets patients they have surgery and uh, at the surgery they remove move the whole of the colon, and and after that they will not have risk of rupture. So. And it, it depends on what, which kind of surgery the, the patient has had. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, we have also received some questions regarding risk and intervention uh, in the chat. And I know that Tristan, you have already answered them, but uh, I think they are quite interesting so that people can hear them. Um, first question, other than blood pressure control, do you have any other suggestions to minimize the risk of uh, this action? Tristan, well, if you want to. Yeah, I just answered actually that um, as Anna mentioned for uh, sports and physical activity, um, high intensity, high hypokinetic energy sports are not recommended because they increase too much the blood pressure acutely. It, it is not the fact that your blood pressure increased, it is the fact that the rate, the, the, the slope of the increase is very acute actually. And uh, I use, uh, we, we use in French uh, a word which that is not able, easily able to translate it in English, which is close tongue efforts, which is mean actually that you push like this, but you block the, the, the fact that yes, you exhale, that you expire. And this is increased a lot the pressure into the thorax. And so this is a risk for dissection or arterial rupture, especially in vets. And the other part is this, not this acute stress on arteries, but the chronic stress on artery, which is due to the blood pressure. And so hypertension, high level of blood pressure really should be controlled very aggressively with drugs to lower the blood pressure because it's a chronic stress on arteries and not an acute stress like sports can do. Thank you very much, uh, Tristan. There is also another question uh, which is quite uh, popular amongst the patient uh, community. Um, and you have also um, replied in the chat, but I think it's also very interesting for all the attendants to, to hear it. Um, if vascular EDS is found out in very young children, does this mean they are more likely to have a more severe case of vascular EDS than someone that has found it uh, found out it later in life? So, uh, as I mentioned, actually depends, and it is really an important uh, notion, something that sh everyone should bear in mind. It depends on if the test was performed on a symptomatic child, on asymptomatic child. And because if it's an asymptomatic child, whatever the time when you make the diagnosis, the, there is no clear 
change really in the treatment in young child. You will wait the age, as I already mentioned, teenage, so the, the age of 12, 13 or 14, 15 years old to uh, start prevention measure and treatment. But if it's a symptomatic child, um, a child of eight years old, for example, with a, a, a dissection of one artery, then you will start prevention measures, cediprodol or another beta blocker, and probably the disease is more severe, but as you start the preventive measures and the treatment earlier, it will reduce the occurrence of new arterial event. Thank you very much, Tristan. Um, yes, um, let's move to the next category, which is the last one and, um, and a very popular one as well, pain. So um, the first question, um, and this is a very touching one actually, this is uh, from one, pain, from one patient that says, uh, why do some clinicians say that vascular EDS is not linked to severe pain and compare it to pain in other EDS types? Maybe they should reconsider how much pain vascular EDS patients are actually in on a daily basis. So do, do you usually also see it in your practice that vascular EDS patients also are very concerned about pain? Anna, do you want to answer um, that question? Yeah. Yes, we unfortunately we do see um, that it's uh, unfortunately quite a common symptom, and um, it's difficult to know why someone would say otherwise. Uh, we we have this uh, experience, we have this knowledge and experience that that patients suffer from pain. Um, uh, from uh, it can be joint or some result after pregnancy with um, and um, many it can be uh, a headache and many different kinds of pain unfortunately so it's difficult to know why this physician uh, would say some some other uh, information do you have any comment tristan <clears throat> well yeah Yes, um, I will see. Thank you, Anna, for, for your answer. I, I completely agree. And I will also emphasize that we should not compare pain between different uh, groups, actually. And uh, pain is one symptom frequently reported, as you mentioned, by patients with VDS. Uh, there is no clear explanation on that. Um, there is some research on the spinal nodes and impact of collagen, but it's more, and there is speculation on sleep apnea also. Um, there is place for research uh, on that topic of pain, and uh, uh, but no clear evidence, uh, no actually specific treatment for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So another one regarding pain. Um, well, actually, we can combine both. Uh, it, first question is uh, regarding pain and uh, migraines and vascular EDS. Is there any research where they look for a link between severe chronic migraine and vascular EDS? And then there's another question again about types of pain. What about gastrointestinal pain in vascular EDS, um, which means alternating pains in the entire gastrointestinal system? Um, with prolapse, with minor bleeding, um, and so on. Joanna, do you uh, yes. want to comment on that? I, I would like to comment on that. And uh, we don't have any research about migraine uh, with VDS, but uh, as you know, migraine is very common. So we would definitely see that uh, just uh, people have both VDS and migraine and a connection. But uh, with well, the gastrointestinal, uh, that's a different uh, thing. Um, th this has been studied that um, uh, uh, really 58% of, of uh, a, a group of French, uh, French studies show that as many as, uh, well, really the majority of that patient had, had uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, 
so so we know about that uh, is is it this is related and Tristan, would you like to add or sorry anna feel free to continue sorry <laughs> Would no, you like I, to think it, that, I think it's it's fine. As the, the migraine is not rare actually in the general population, so it may be coincident with pets, and it is not specifically associated actually with VDS. Um, the treatment for migraines sometimes um, again should be in accordance with the physicians that take care of the VDS because there is some migraine treatment that we will not recommend uh, for VDS patient like for example triptan and we will more recommend beta blockers for example there is a uh, registered beta blocker for migraine as the chronic treatment so uh, again talk between the neurologist or the and the migraine specialist and the, the the specialist of the EDS is very very important. Thank you, thank you, uh, Anna and Tristan. And um, I think we can uh, take the last question from the previously gathered questions and regarding pain. Um, what are the best ways to help with pain? <laughs> So the floor is yours. <laughs> I think you're muted, Anna. Um, well, there are some considerations here and you would want to know what kind of pain it is, because, for example, neuropathic pain can have its own treatment. But we really want to mention this uh, concept of uh, uh, of non-medical management of pain if it's if it's a question of chronic pain and um, you may ask your family physician for a referral to a multidisciplinary pain clinic um, if it's if it's a concept of chronic pain because there are so very many factors that influence pain uh, it's you need to think about the whole life situation with uh, sleep nutrition and uh, so uh, non-medical pain management that that could really be uh, a very important thing to consider thank you anna would you like to add any comment on that no it's fine i agree with anna um maybe the best we can summarize that the best way to manage pain is a non-medical pain management and as mentioned anna it should be uh, on different approaches, techniques, and not focusing only on painkillers. Perfect. Thank you very much. So actually, we could take the last five minutes to to pick up some uh, questions from the chat. Um, the first one: Are there any known links to vascular DS and sleep disorders? As fatigue is a prominent feature, often with an unknown pathophysiology. Could sleep disorder be the answer? Well, I slightly already mentioned it. Um, yes, there is probably, um, possibly, I would say, than more than probably, uh, there is possibly sleep disorder due to sleep apnea, due to uh, the fact that uh, um, the the tissue maybe is is uh, a little more uh, softened and. Uh, uh, less um, stiff, so the tongue can go back and uh, cause this sleep apnea. But there is test uh, to uh, diagnose sleep apnea, so it can be performed and done in VDS patient, like all patients. And if it's positive, if the diagnosis is made, you can have um, a von nocturnal ventilatory system that will decrease this apnea and so you will have less fatigue in the daylight. Thank you. Well, let's take a last one. Um, for instance, they are asking again about nutrition. Uh, is there, oh, this is very, very popular amongst the EDS community. Is there any evidence that collagen supplements can help with symptoms like hair thinning or many, many other symptoms. What about collagen? 
and, and taking collagen supplements. I can handle this question maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so collagen is uh, demonstrated for riddles, but uh, not for the extracellular collagen around the arteries. So if you take, if you uh, um, take with your food collagen, it will no go around the arteries. And this is a problem actually. The, the, as I mentioned, it's a, an extracellular protein produced by the cells of the arterial wall. And so it not, does not go from the gut to the uh, surrounding uh, mat extracellular matrix of the artery. So it's useless to buy collagen in uh, um, nutrient uh, stores or I don't know on the internet. Um, I, I guess you lose money, then uh, you uh, increase the uh, stiffness of your arteries. Thank you, Tristan. Would you like to add uh, something on that, Anna? Um, oh, I, I just agree. Uh, it, it would be a waste of money, really. And um, I think we have one more minute for the last one. Um, there was a question. Oh, I just saw it and it just disappeared. Um, OK, but I can remember that it is. It is a question regarding if you see episodes in specific uh, periods in uh, during the life, like in puberty or um, infancy or in the adulty and so on, if you see that there is a correlation between the age and uh, more episodes or more severe episodes. Anna, do you want to comment or shall I start? I can, yeah, so as I already mentioned, the, with age there is an increase of stiffness of the arteries. It's, it's physiological, as I already mentioned. Uh, it's due to several physiological uh, processes. So the peak of the arterial events observed in cohorts actually is between, I would say, between 18 and 40 years old. This is a peak. But for an individual, you don't know when actually the arterial event can occur. And so there is very rare events in young child. This is already what I mentioned. And with age, the number of arterial events is decreasing because of the stiffening of the arteries due to age. I can just add something. I, I would like to answer one question from Monse Son Sona um, about uh, arterial and venous blood gases in the emergency room. This is true that we do not recommend, and this is the case for our um, emergency physicians in our institution, that we, we contradicate the arterial blood gas, um, except in very rare cases where it is really important to obtain this arterial blood sample, but in general, we should not perform arterial blood gas at the emergency room. For the venous function, it is really simple and rare are the complication or the, it, it, it might be a bruise, uh, an hematoma, but it's not a rupture of the vein, whereas for the artery is is more um, complicated to uh, heal the artery after the puncture for the blood gas. So we do not recommend usual arterial blood gas at the emergency room uh, for VDS patients. Thank you very much, Tristan. Um, well, uh, I think we are run out of time and there are still several questions to be answered. So we would really to welcome you uh, in our second session for this webinar. We are holding a new webinar on all uh, everything you wanted to know about the vascular EBS on the 23rd of May at uh, 6 uh, p.m. Central Central European uh, summertime. So um, it has been a pleasure. 
I would like to thank um, I would like to thank Bastern for organizing this webinar. It has been really amazing uh, trying this new format with uh, videos, uh, questions, answers. Anna and Tristan, thank you very much for offering yourself. Um, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues that have worked on this, Alessandra, Teresa, Claire, Iris and Jarrett, and all the patients that have been contributed either with the videos and questions and today with their attendance. So uh, thank you everyone for being here and we see you again on the 23rd of May.